I think to solidify the entire discussion, we should start with the fact that when we look at Jimmy, especially at first, or the skeleton-faced hooligan, as I've called him before, in the past, he's sitting back in this car here, it, ignoring his parents. In the setup of family, in direct relation to that, we sort of see already Jimmy's attitude towards parents, towards the world around him. It's also interesting to note that Geronimo Barrer, the producer for Bully, wanted to draw a ton of similarities between Jimmy and Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. Uh, his use of the word phony is something that you always saw Holden using when he was in his different adventures and moving from prep school to prep school. And there's a lot of reflection here. The novelist J.D. Salinger himself didn't actually get along very well with his father. He's quite distanced from both his mother and his father. And we see that, at least in Jimmy, somewhat played out here in this car scene. And it all makes sense. Also, even the way you look at her, his mom, and how she's dressed, it's even easy to draw some similarities there between Holden Caulfield's mom, the actress, and this mother here, especially in some of the things that they talk about, like just going off on vacation for weeks on end. And of course, we're seeing Bullsworth now. Now, it's interesting to note that Salinger himself went to Valley Forge Military Academy, which has some stunning similarities overall to Holden Caulfield's The Pensy Prep that he went to, as well as Bullsworth in this game. So you have a reflection of a reflection into this title. A lot of this is also mimicked even by the headmaster when he gives his little spiel. And if you look at Forge Military Academy, they basically say young men fully prepared to meet responsibility, alert in mind, sound in body, considerate of others, and a high sense of duty, honor, loyalty, and courage, which is strangely a lot like what Crabblesnitch tells him when you first meet him. After some trouble himself, Salinger went on to do very well at Valley Forge. I think this is sort of mimicked here. It's mimicked both in Holden's story and Catcher in the Rye, but as well here as Jimmy. You can sort of see, as the game progresses, Jimmy do better and better. And I don't just mean academically, I mean finally fitting in. Of course, you have a secretary. Crabblesnitch's secretary cracks me up. There's already, even from the very get-go, this feeling of adults just not having any real clue what's going on throughout all of Bully, actually. And it does a really good job setting up the antagonists I'll talk about later. This is really a great setup for the scene itself that is coming and just for understanding what Bullsworth is about. You have this pompous ability of this person to deliver this basically terrible speech you know almost right away is a lie. The way she's giving that speech and the way she talks about the headmaster versus who you meet and how they are, at least through most of the game, is really telling for Bullsworth itself and for how the Academy is going to treat people. Of course, let's talk a little bit about Jimmy. He is intriguing. One of the first things you're going to notice right away is that he is shorter than most game characters we see. And he certainly isn't the prettiest. He's red-faced, acne, shaved skin. He's even got a big mark on his face from a scar on the top of his head. He really is an outcast both in dress, but also just the appearance. Geronimo Barrera again once stated that he wants this character to be sort of a character that every kid can understand and at least get and that's the thing is he is a combination of various different elements some somebody may have others they may not let's look at game design here just for a second when creating a character you usually have these two options you have created characters modified by the player and then those created by the creators themselves the producers the writers early on it was decided that jimmy would be fully fleshed out and the only thing he would gain through the game was the trinity of world design actions that could be taken in the story itself to make sure that they didn't relegate the player to the back seat. The setup for Bully here is actually really interesting. It's the fact that you get in a fight right away. Now, you can run from these bullies, but the game isn't called Bully for no reason. And originally, it was planned to be about Jimmy being the bully, but that changed over time to Bullsworth itself being the bully and the entire environment. It's very presence in the way the kids deal with one another, and we see it right here. Also, Excellent animation here at times. When you grab a hold of somebody, you can actually see a surprise look on their face. Various different elements of graphic feedback to the game player that is really well done. If you played this game before, one of the things you're going to notice is you can't pull off any of the advanced moves at all. In fact, some of the basic moves you can't here in this first fight. I just love this setup. It's such a great way of sort of understanding all the different antagonists and how they're going to go about it. Nobody's helping you, right? You can tell right away. Nobody's going to come to your aid. In fact, the prefects are going to end up getting you and trying to put you in detention. So you take on these three hooligans, basically three people who are introducing you to Bullsworth Academy and how it's going to set you up. And boom, you're the one who basically gets in trouble. What I do like about this first fight is the fact that it's one of the few fights where you can be caught by the prefects and you won't be taken 
directly into the game's next step. This is done on purpose so that you can, well, do this, run around and kick people on the ground or explore a little bit of Bullsworth before the game actually begins. I really adore that. After this, that is not what happens. Even if he grabs, I'll let him grab me. Even if he grabs me and he knocks me down, it'll actually reset to right prior to this event where that game save is instead of moving you forward into the cutscene. There's various different reasons for that, but it works so well as a primer because there's only a couple ways to get by these guys to really start the game. That's to try to walk past them. Now, sometimes this works, but many times it actually doesn't. Or you can fight them, basically bullying them, or you can run past them. But either way, if you do any kind of battle, there's a chance that prefix are going to catch you. And I love this infinite respawning battle moment. It sort of teaches you and identifies one or two of the game mechanics early. That being, of course, that there are a bunch of social clicks going on here as well, something that I will cover. You'll also notice the way these guys are dressed, which is the atypical polo shirt sports star look that this particular click has chosen. Yeah, this is just some excellent feedback here. The way they slowly fall back when you knock them out too, they're not really powered down like a superhero. You hit them and they just sort of crumple up and fall or do that right there. Very cool. Also, the fact that you can hit them while on the ground is hilarious. Pretty violent, but you figure out sort of why that is later. So we'll let this prefect catch me and I'll show you guys what happens again. It doesn't matter if he takes me down. I'm going to reset back. So I'm going to jump ahead a bit. He caught me again, and now we're moving on. I'm going to start the game proper. We're going to go to that first cutscene with Crabble Snitch, and we're going to see a lot of similarities, like I said, between Catcher in the Rye, between J.D. Salinger's uh, original life and Bully itself. It's important to remember that Jimmy's been to many schools. What we're going to find out is those schools really didn't need him. He is needed here. And this, once again, breaks from the original idea that the game started out with Jimmy being the bully. Also, this is funny that Salinger, when he ended up failing out of a school prior to going to Forge Military Academy, this is what they wrote on his notes. And it really does fit Jimmy in a way. This is what the school officials wrote. Under the subject of character, was rather hard hit by adolescence his last year with us. Ability, plenty, industry, did not know the word. I swear, that is exactly Jimmy. They did such a good job. And of course, Catcher in the Rye and J.D. Salinger's life all mixing together to create this guy. I love Jimmy as a character. Now, back here at the animation time when this game was made, we didn't see any Havoc engines or anything crazy going on. So you'll notice a lot of different issues with this game engine in particular. Like when Jimmy climbs up steps, you're not going to see a lot of animation. And of course, here we get Crabble Snitch. Let's listen. So you must be Hopkins. Uh, uh-huh. What? Uh-huh. What? I meant yes, sir. Very good. Now, let me see. You've done a lot of naughty things, haven't you? Vandalism, graffiti, bad language, violent conduct, disrespecting staff. Oh, I'm scared of you, Hopkins. Come on, give me a break. Yes, I've never met a boy like you. Never in all my life. Hopkins, you're quite the nastiest little boy I have ever encountered. Tell me, why should I waste my time on you? I don't know. Because it's my calling. It's what I do. You excel at causing trouble, and I excel at fixing little boys like you, at making you into respectable members of our community here at the Academy. I've got a good feeling about you, boy, a feeling you and I are going to be great friends. You keep that nose clean, boy or I shall clean it myself. Miss Danvers, are you back yet? Yes, Headmaster, and I got your tea. You are good to me, Miss Danvers. No more than you deserve, Headmaster. Take our new friend Hopkins here and show him around the school and get him properly attired. Certainly, Headmaster. Come along, boy. I haven't got all day. And boy, remember, you will have a clean nose. So keep it clean, or we'll clean it for you. So that is easily one of the best scenes in the game, and I want to play it through so I can talk about some stuff. One of the first things you'll notice is behind Crabble Snitch, you'll see a bust. That's actually the way he was going to look in the game before they softened him up a bit. There's a reason why they softened him up, too, because they decided that it really didn't make sense for everybody to hate Jimmy. And so while the headmaster is certainly a disciplinarian, you find out, especially later, that he does have a bit of a soft spot for Jimmy 
over time. You also, if you walk around the city and you explore, occasionally you're going to read or hear about indications that Crabble Snitch's own parents had some issues with authority when they were younger. So this might be a reflection of his sort of identification of not doing that himself, but having a soft spot for kids that do. And this is also one of the first places you'll notice where there's a bit of a militant style from Crabble Snitch, and certainly, at least on the outside, from Bullsworth itself with the nose clean boy or I shall clean it myself. That is basically something that you would hear at a military style academy. This is one of the only reflections you really get because we find out quite quickly that Bullsworth is falling apart. It's absolutely corrupt and it's corrupt through the eyes of Jimmy, which we're going to notice in a bit. So you see here, Miss Danvers, I love that secretary. Some of the way she treats the headmaster and just that belief that he's perfect. We get to see that sort of fall apart, but in a good way, in a way that really does build that character. And I'll clean it for you, he says once again. Let's listen to Jimmy's thoughts for a second. So here I am at probably the worst school in the country, whose alumni are nothing but arms dealers, serial killers, and corporate lawyers. Real scum. And that old creep thinks he can tame me? We shall see, my friend. I only give people what they have coming to them. Once again, we have a reflection there of Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye and sort of the attitude. But as Jimmy gets prepared to walk around the place and sort of identify with the different groups going on, I love that snippet showing his thoughts of his uh, thoughts of the alumni, his thoughts of the people that actually came from this school. He doesn't believe that there's anything useful coming from this school. And really, when you consider the way the game's set up and its specifics, when it comes to classes, there really isn't much. But when it comes to social understanding, there certainly is. Here we, of course, see once again another character color-coded. This is something that you're going to see throughout all of Bully if you play it, is there's a color-coding of the different cliques within the group. Also, you'll see people smarten off to Jimmy. This is something that occurs depending on how he's dressed and which group it is. Different cliques, of course, treating him differently. When we break down Bullsworth and we look at its setup here especially, you can certainly see that it's set up on a typical northeast, south, and west compass point type of setting. It also looks like a cross to get to the different places, the girls' dorm, the men's dorm, and so forth. But actually, there are shortcuts between all of them. These are one of the pillars that Bully, I think, really excels at, which is showing you different ways to go about whatever you need to go about. But as a child would, there isn't any kind of really super adult way or super adult feeling or motive to any of this. You find a little shortcut through a barbed wire fence or something like that. There's something very real about it. You don't have to cut it or anything like that. Also, people have asked me about the seasons. Yes, of course, there are multiple seasons in the game, and the game has a really heady connection to time, which I'll get to in a second. Of course, here, once again, we see that Bullsworth isn't cleaned up. It's not taken care of. You couldn't compare it to, say, Hogwarts, which is taken care of even though the kids can get killed. Here, it's more the outside facade is one way and everything else the other. Once again, we are now jumped. This is where we're going to get the tutorial for a lot of the combat action, and we're going to see that Jimmy can handle himself. He can take anybody but the prefix and the teachers for the most part. Even in groups, he can usually take down any of the groups, the cliques, the enemies that he ends up facing off. Here, of course, it'll show you the grab and the grapple punches and then the throw and then ground kicks. Now, these are just a small assortment of moves that he unlocks as he learns moves from different characters in the game. I really did like this because most of them are still based around a young kid's kind of attacks. They're isn't a lot of maturity in what goes on here. There's none of that gritty realness of, let's say, GTA. We also first learn how to humiliate somebody, which in the original game idea was going to be one of the major parts that occurs. But here really is more about just Jimmy penalizing people who come up against him. Except, of course, for this giant dude who just absolutely knocks his block off with one punch. It's very funny. Once again, we're introduced to another teacher. This teacher also basically not caring about the kids at all. Yells at him to not get his uniform on. Should have already known that he's a new child anyway, but didn't seem to know that or care and sends him on his way. Jimmy, of course, now nursing some kind of black eye. Ah, Gary. He easily is one of my favorite characters in a game. Gary right away indicates that he's medicated, indicates that he's most likely incredibly excitable, and from the very get-go alerts you that he isn't that good of a person. In fact, Jimmy really ends up siding with him, but more with Pete as the game continues on. 
But Gary is very forceful, as you can see here. And he's really telling him how I can be your friend. He even calls him friend multiple times. This is something in psychology you hear a lot. Whenever anybody uses friend when they talk to you, more often than not, that's a defensive measure between two people who aren't actually sure of their original status. I love that. I love that use. So here, once again, we see that the interior isn't taken care of. Bullsworth just is not that good of a place. You'll see the arcade machine is out of order. There's spray paint on the painting there of Crabble Snitch. While it does sort of indicate that this is just an unruly place and a place ruled by the kids, it also once again shows that the parents, the teachers have sent these kids to these places to sort of get rid of them. And we see that replicated here. Of course, you'll also notice a little bit of a subtle color coding here that's going on with these characters. This helps the gamer, especially when you're running around in the city or you're running around in Bullsworth Academy, to identify different clicks at a distance depending on your popularity to them and how you want to treat them, how you want to go about. You'll also notice there's no clock, and I'll get to that in a moment, at least for right now. So when you go in to change uniforms, one of the first things that you notice, especially with Jimmy, is that nothing he wears actually in any way, shape, or form looks like it fits him. Everything's disheveled. Everything has a bit of a punk vibe to it, or a different style of vibe at the very least. This is something that's replicated through everything that he wears and sort of allows you to reflect your attitude across. And we have Pete. Pete really is one of those guys is just really nice. At first, Jimmy treats him as you would expect him to most likely treat him, especially in a place like this, a place of hard knocks. But over time, they end up getting a friendship, and Pete really plays off as a more subtle muse for Jimmy and sort of assists Jimmy in making some decisions he needs to make later on that don't include just always headbutting people. I love this moment. It's such a subtle reflection on the old comment. If you're mean to the waiter, but you're nice to me, you're still a mean person. And that's what we see from Gary towards Pete. We can see it. Yes, there's a pecking order, but it's past that with both of these two. And you start to notice it also, once again, the color coding of the science and the normal preppies. This is something that you'll see as it continues on, which you get the idea. You sort of understand where Gary is coming from. Now, this is right prior to us setting up the timeline for the game and identifying more of the rules that are going to occur here in Bully that we need to understand to fit within the gameplay dynamics of going to classes and, of course, exploring the game world and getting the missions done. Of course, we'll go out into the city and explore for a little bit, but I do want to talk about how this world is actually a combination of many time frames, and it's easy to miss unless you look closely. If you look at the greasers, they belong maybe a full 20 to 30 years prior to the setting in the game. But if you look around at different elements, you'll see that a lot of different time frames are locked in it to sort of perfectly match up. Well, some groups range from, let's say, 1980s to maybe 1990s. The original design in the game was so that both younger kids and adults would be able to find some common ground within the game, no matter how old they were when they played it. I think this can be difficult for a lot of games, and Bully does a really good job capturing nostalgia from various different eras to cover this and to allow everybody to feel mixed in and as a group. In fact, even the internet is mentioned at times, and you notice when you travel around the city in particular, that some of the locations have been sucked in from different timelines and set down, and they've done a very good job mending these. This is something that they've definitely picked up and they've perfected in later titles, but I think they did a pretty good job in Bully. Remember that Bully's more of an open neighborhood or an open town kind of game, not an open city. I think they did well here. Once again, we can see the pecking order already starting. You see a greaser there, you see science kids, and you see the sports guys and the preps. You see them all together, sort of identifying how the bully system is working. And that guy, of course, comes right up to me and punches me, so I gotta beat his ass. Once again, excellent animations on their faces to show that pain as I beat the ever, oh, okay. Hang on one second. Let me get out from there and run. And we'll head directly into the first class. You also notice that at this time, no clock is up. That's because they didn't want to force you to this first class. You get to sort of decide as you unlock the first couple missions before it basically fully unlocks. I really do enjoy this tutorial. Gary walks you around town, his consistent one-liners about the different people here, but also they teach you the social elements that you can do in the game, like bribing other characters, thumbs up, thumbs down, and so forth. Also, throughout this entire time, it's just so hilarious to notice prefix aren't around. It's just down and out, too. Trash in various places. Bullworth really tries to keep it together, 
Even the teachers, though, have really fallen apart. No one cares. As you continue to play the game, you realize that Jimmy is needed here. He's actually needed to fulfill a place in Bullsworth that doesn't have anybody at that point. And it's something that at the past schools, he indicates really didn't occur. Also, while he does basically become king of the school here, that could be looked at any different way. It appears, even from the starting, he doesn't want it. And it's not like a lot of other fictional tropes where it's thrust on a reluctant leader. Here, he's reluctant the entire time. He's a little bit like Conan at the end, looking at his crown and sitting on his throne and not really being happy with where he is. When you finally do complete the game, you get this feeling, this a subtle feeling that a lot of what Jimmy has done isn't really going to matter too much to him in particular, but it will to Bullsworth itself. And I do like that. I think it does a great job. And this is, continues through a lot of the people that he impacts throughout the game. Ah, prefects. So this is the tutorial that'll teach you how to hide in trash cans. This is one of the things that certainly does come up a lot in the game is the understanding that there's different elements of difficulty here. You can certainly take on multiple kids. It's one of the things that Jimmy's good at is kicking the absolute crap out of everybody. But when it comes to the prefects and the teachers, you really can't. And by hiding, they'll take out other enemies. I love the fact that this is, again, a reflection of them not really caring. They'll sort of take anybody down and it doesn't really matter. So we're going to follow Gary. He's going to show us a couple more things and then we're going to get to our first class. Let's talk about game design when it comes to this world for a second. We see that it is fairly basic. This, of course, is a sign of the times, 2006. This is an older style game. Doesn't have the ability to throw a bunch of polygons around. But one thing I do like about it is their sense of time that they use. Right now, we're doing some missions. We're going to learn how to make people like us or dislike us and get our first technical kiss or girlfriend. This does a really good job of solidifying Jimmy as a child in the game. But as you continue to move on and do more things, you start to really identify with how the game limits the location via the time frame, but at the same time can feel big. When it comes to the chapter and story breaks, the game really has this intermixed feeling of missions based around the teachers and those living in the nearby town, as well as your classes and what's going on here. As you play Bully, one of the things you will notice is that there's sort of the policing system here with the prefects and the teachers. But when you move out into the main story locations into the city, it happens a great deal less. It's usually easier to get away from. There are still cops and there's times where you can be caught. But it works in really two ways here. It gives a set of rules to the player and understanding of the structure of the game, which I think is less freeform than GTA and certainly some of their other titles. But it works to push certain activities to a primary spot, depending on safety, depending on classes and depending on those missions. It's a really well done Trinity there. Lastly, I think that with the missions, the way they're set up and with the time frames, this extends really the perceived distance within Bully. This place is not necessarily huge. If you're out and about exploring, it's on a time limit. If you're at school, it's on a time limit or you're sprinting into buildings to stop the prefects from getting you. So let's look at some of these clicks is the library. And those are the preps. They're all money and condescending attitudes. Yeah, massively inbred and completely brainless. Very observant, Jimmy boy. Now over there are the greasers. They think they're tough. Or at least try to look tough. Wouldn't advise messing with them, at least not yet. They hang by the auto shop. And last but not least, the jocks. These guys rule the school. Definitely avoid them. Whatever, I'm not afraid of some dumb roid monkeys. You'll learn. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I love the fact here too. It's the very first moment Gary gets to basically completely abandon you and he does. So now the time limit is sort of set and it's identifying where you need to go and you have a particular time amount to get there. Otherwise, you end up not getting the bonuses of going through those classes. This is interesting to remember because the game doesn't necessarily flunk you or anything like that if you don't go to those classes. But by doing so, you get various unlocks throughout the game. I do also like the fact that those unlocks are at least somewhat connected to the subjects you're studying. So we'll get to class and I'll show you the first one, chemistry. We see in a lot of game design, especially open world design, that many titles will end up unlocking different items for you, and they don't really make a lot of sense how they get unlocked. It'll just be like, hey, congratulations, you finished this mission. Here's a flamethrower. And you're all, really? Because there were clowns I was attacking. What's the flamethrower got to do with it? Though a flamethrower clown would be very cool. 
Here, when it comes to the different classes, they are somewhat connected to what you get. I think the first time we're going to get a firecracker here, once I pass this chemistry class. The chemistry classes, all the classes get progressively harder as you go up and you get different scores. But it really does feel at least a little bit connected. And I think that's very important because once again, we talked about it could be adults, could be kids playing this game. You want to make sure everything ties together as well as it can, but you don't have to be absolutely dogmatic about it. Here is sort of a soft item that's given to you, and it matches together with what maybe kids back then would have done. Now, if you do it, you're going to get shot. What Bully does do a little forcibly is, well, there you go. It ends up whenever you unlock an item or usually when you unlock an item pretty quickly, it gives you, I guess, a time frame in which you can use it there right away, almost like a mini tutorial. There again, teacher, because it's in the middle of class. Look at that teacher. She's just like, she's just looking. She's all, hmm, that does look strange. This guy's beating the shit out of the other kid. Okay, they stopped. I love the sense of just debris and not care that this entire school has. Rockstar's always been good at building a game and making it feel like a lived in place. And despite this being 2006, Xbox 360, I believe the Wii, this older style title, they do a really good job. Let's listen to Crabble Snitch. You seem to be making yourself quite comfortable here, my boy. I'm just trying to fit in. By fighting? By making a nuisance of yourself? That is not the Bullworth way, boy. Yeah, you could have fooled me. What? I said you could have fooled me. This place is full of bullies and maniacs. Nonsense. That's just school spirit. Hijinks. Why, in my day, we felt nothing of castrating the new boys. I want you to stop this nonsense, Hopkins. I want you to behave yourself. You might learn something. Fine. Can I go now, sir? On your way. Hey, I saw you sucking up to Crabble Snitch. What? Shut up. Screw you, new kid. This is what we do to teachers' pets around here. You better not. Ow! <laughs> come here, you little. Yeah, come and get me. I love the fact that Crabble Snitch just, he's so oblivious. And yet at the same time, once again, if you listen closely there, that's one of the first indications that he didn't necessarily, maybe at least as a child, have the best upbringing himself and certainly the best experience at school, even if he was one of the bullies. Once again, the overarch feel of this title is laid out there. Now, as I chase Davis, I also want to say it's interesting that whenever you go to detention, Crabble Snitch reads what you've done. And a lot of times those indications are connected to what you actually have done. It's not always can. Let's take this guy out here. I love that the auto shop has some kind of Mad Max entry to it. Oh yeah, it's trying to get me to do an exact thing here. Look at that. Animation's really good with Jimmy pushing, doing the old football chop, trying to get the guy to move around such good animation for a game that was old like this. It really is done well. All right, got him. Move through. When you're experiencing bully, it's easy to notice certainly older style level design that we get in these games. Again, I was talking about distance earlier with the game world not really being that big, but they've cut it up and they've chopped it and they've sort of made some locations a bit maze-like on purpose. There's some hijinks that occur later on and they occur around that design which i do like there's some shortcuts you find and so forth those are really interesting but overall you do see what we would consider now probably a bit antiquated design to sort of chop up a location and stop your ability to traverse from one side to the other as fast as you would like this is a pretty telling moment here as you chase down this guy and you fight different enemies. It's preparing you overall for the way the game is going to dole out enemies going on in the future. I do like this. I think it's a bit antiquated. We certainly notice that now. It does feel a bit chopped off and especially with doors opening and closing right in front of you. We don't get that as much anymore, but what it is doing is typically setting up the goons and then, of course, the main boss, which is Davis himself with his slingshot here. There's various different ways to take down the bosses, which is really interesting because I don't think a lot of people actually picked up on this. So I'll take the brick and knock him down. But one of the things that the game actually does is it has various enemies that are main bosses that can be taken down in one hit or by doing something slightly different. For example, there is a major boss later in the game that by giving him a swirly in a toilet, you win the you win that match automatically. You just absolutely beat him. Or a later boss that you can defeat basically with a wedgie. I really did like that. A lot of those are hidden. You actually don't know that they're there. They don't do an incredible job of making sure you absolutely know that they're going to be in that location. You're going to be able to take that activity. And to me, that really elevates the gameplay of Bully up to 
a higher element. It doesn't need to be in your face. The subtlety that you sometimes get, especially in a game like this, that for a lot of people, it might hinge a little bit towards a younger age. There's a lot of subtlety here and a lot of cool ways in which you can progress forward through some of these missions that you don't quite know about right away. Here on the left, we get another indicator of how the game splits across the different policing systems that it has to further that gameplay. Now you have truancy as well as the bullies themselves in the game to watch out for. And I like that mixture there. Again, this is something that isn't replicated necessarily as much in town. You can still get in trouble for truancy there, but like I said, it's more open environments, so it's overall easier to get away from those enemies in those locations. Whoops, missed that guy. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit so that we can go out into town and look at this. This is set up the very typical way where when you go to different locations, they'll be separated usually by a bridge or some kind of underpass to delineate the differences that you may experience in the different locations, as well as the wealth and so forth. This is certainly something that as you continually progress in the game, you go from the dregs to the industrial area to absolutely some of the nicer looking places in town. There's really a replication of every single one of the groups somewhere in town, or at least their locations in town. And of course, Jimmy can unlock hideouts in any one of these locations that are all reflective of what you're going to see. This current mission is a mission for the cook. You need to go and get various foods. So looking at the locations themselves, I have to say for 2006, this doesn't look bad at all. There's a lot of really enjoyable locations. It certainly does have a feeling of being more barren, something that as technology has moved forward, the memory footprint of the consoles, the memory footprint just of the ability of any program to use that available RAM has really increased and we see more clutter, we see more, let's say variation in texturing and so forth. But here, overall, I think they did a pretty good job. When it comes to the animations, I love the fact that they decided to just have Jimmy toss that bike when he gets off of it. I don't know if anybody else, when they were a young kid, that's the way we would always get off the bike. You would never just slow down and step off. We would always just toss the bike like that, full speed except uh, sometimes this would happen and you'd get caught. Let me get the bike away from the entry. Uh-oh, I don't think that's far enough. It's not. <laughs> ah, hard point entries in, oh, come on. Off the bike, off the bike. Hey, we never said Jimmy was incredibly intelligent. Okay, there we go, yum yum market. I do like the interiors. I think they did a good job. They put people in them. Some of the games during this time frame, in particular, the memory footprint that they had for the games, they couldn't get people inside of stores a lot of times. There wasn't really enough memory to do that. So you would enter a store and it might be supposedly a busy bustling one, but there would only be you inside of it. Also, the bus stops. People have asked me, why do they exist in the game? Really the only major reason these do is because there are time limited quests like Edna's quest here, where riding your bike can actually cause you to not hit that quest time that you need to hit to succeed. And if you don't, you sadly got to redo the entire mission. So there's many times where you'll want to do that in Bully. We see that in a lot of games, transportation systems, whether it be subways in some games, whether it be here, the bus, whether it be taxis. This is really an identification of a weakness that open world games can have in particular. If you want to play the characters, let's say not a thug, if you want to play him as not a robber, well, you wouldn't be knocking people off your freaking bike all the time. You wouldn't be stealing their cars all the time. So those open transit systems allow for two things. One, they allow for convenience or a quality of life for the gamer to allow the gamer to move from point to point without having to traverse all the places, especially if they've traversed them many times. That's one of the reasons why a lot of quick location kind of travel systems will have you actually have to get to the end destination at least once before you can unlock that. And the second reason, of course, is as I said before, that ability for you to play the way you may want to play. There may not be a bike around. You may want to get back to Bullsworth as quickly as possible. So of course, having the bus makes sense. Additionally, the bus makes sense because it's a game about school. Even though the fact is, is that that school bus wouldn't be driving around from point to point to point to point all day. It doesn't really matter. It solidifies it a little bit. In fact, I know a lot of people who were like, that makes a lot of sense. It's a school bus. And you were like, it's a school bus. It's like one o'clock at night. Ah, the skateboard. <laughs> Never quite get the handle of this. It always takes me a little bit of time. Interestingly enough, data miners have found a ton of information about locations in Bully that never made it into the normal game. This is pretty normal. 
games will end up having different locations of different characters that just don't get into the game. They're cut for various reasons or after being recorded and put together, it just doesn't really hit the way the developer had planned. One of the locations that was found, though, was an awesome skate park. I think that's really cool. And some larger grassy areas that were most likely going to be some kind of major park. But unfortunately, were cut out and we don't see them in the actual game itself. Would have been nice to have Jimmy be able to go and do that kind of stuff. Of course, there's the police officer, but I'm just going right past him. It's like, screw that. Let me find out where I am here. And I'll move forward a little bit. So as we travel through Bullsworth, one of the things that we pick up quite easily, if you're looking, is... The game doesn't do the greatest job with its life systems. It tries. There's certainly different things that occur. You also see all of the students sort of milling around, but you see them milling around at the same time that you could have just seen them in school. And it's not like you where you see them leave on a skateboard or anything like that. It's just the various different memory requirements for these games. It doesn't do a terrible job, but at times I really do wish that they didn't flood the actual town with students because some of those students in particular are easily noticeable due to the way they dress or the various different ways in which their body mechanics, their models were created. A lot of people may not know this, but if you end up defeating the game, if you end up getting all the way to the end, you go through the different seasons, which I'll show you some of the Halloween, I'll maybe show you some of the different winter seasons, but you get through all the seasons and the game actually unlocks the open world itself, which is sort of unlocked already in the title, but turns it into an endless summer moment, almost like a child when you went out of school and you in, went into that summer and you had all of these dreams about what you were going to do. And they did a pretty good job with that and basically still allow you to perform some of the side missions and do some of the side activities as well. Let's go into the boxing area. So this is a mission that's going to teach Jimmy the basics of boxing and this comes up later in one of the cutscenes and then one of the main bosses. Again, interestingly enough, there is multiple times where the game will show you one way to defeat it and put that within the actual cutscene, like this with boxing. But you'll find out later, as I said before, there are some bosses where you actually don't need to do that to defeat them. I like that. It's a subtle way. It's a way of saying, oh yeah, here's the way you're supposed to do it. But what it does is it rewards exploration. It rewards experimentation, and that's always very cool. So I'll skip through this. When you perform that particular mission, it certainly does call back to punch out on the NES. So as you win and do these major events for these major different groups, you end up unlocking their hideouts. And their hideouts, each one, like I said before, reflects the hideout and the characters around it, the characters that would live in it. Unfortunately, you never see people in those hideouts. So when you go into them, it's always like you took them over, you kicked everybody out and you were like, okay, good enough. So here we get the beach house. But when we go to the beach house or the clubhouse on the beach, you find that, well, really no one's there but you. It's a nice place. It certainly looks better than some of the others. It's got working video games. One of the things that you'll see in the game, sort of a side activity. I do like the way it looks. And I like how each one, of course, is set up in a particular area of the game to give you a place that you can sleep, you can move on, so you don't end up having to go back to Bullsworth every single time. Here, you can see one, two, three, four technically play. If you consider the park one of those places, you can consider it four to five larger explorable locations. We're going to run down here. Oh, sorry, lady. We're going to run down here to the beach clubhouse so I can show you guys this. 2006 water, baby. There's a character with a side mission. We'll skip them. It's enjoyable to play a game in 2006 because when you're playing it, you realize, oh, it doesn't have like boats that you can jump on or ski doos because this was really before the time was available for developers to put all that in a game. And a lot of times a game, you would just die or something if you hit the water or it would stop you from going out very far. It's just sort of a different feel to this title. You can feel that older age to it. Not in a bad way, though, because they are doing some pretty crazy things for it, even back then. Let's listen to some of the music. And of course, here you can hear that reflection of a more cultured overall state. But let's listen to the bully main theme and how that captures it. It 
it really does show the importance of music. It shows the importance of understanding and reflecting not only what's going on screen overall, but also just how the world itself should be reflected in the music. And you have this playful music in this game that does such a good job. It really doesn't matter what you're doing, even if you're being chased by enemies and it goes into the more percussion heavy moments, you still get this feeling of nostalgia. There's a whimsicalness, a playfulness to all of the music that goes throughout the game. And it matches it perfectly. Let's go to another location here. I think we're going to go to the park so you guys can see some of that. Now, the park is where Jimmy really ends up coming of age in various ways. You can take dates there. You can meet girls there. You can play different games there. It's a very cool location. It's also timeless. Once again, it's just a park next to the city. There isn't really a reason for it to even be there. It's just sort of always there. I loved that element. It always made me question. It always made me go like, when exactly is this? And where exactly is this? Where this park would just be here, regardless of the season overall. So moving us forward a bit to get to the actual park, this is very interesting as a place because if you notice there on the left with the grass and the overlaying textures, it looks rough compared to every other place. In fact, if you walk around and look here, it looks disused, and I think you're supposed to get the idea this is like one of those carnivals where you never know if kids are going to fly off the freaking rocket slide as it goes down. But it's different here because it doesn't necessarily look like that's what they were trying to reflect. It almost looks like it's unfinished. There's places where textures overlap, and there's a roughness to this area that in multiple Rockstar games does not exist. And I would love to know what was actually occurring here. I think it also, though, shows Rockstar's chops in developing locations and making them varied. There really is a lot of things you can do here. I think if you've been playing video games for any really set period of time, you're going to pick up on a lot of open world titles that, let's say, don't let you go into locations or really perform anything at the location. Even GTA 4 had this. GTA 5, of course, has this as well. So it's not like saying that just because in the future we have more technology, we can fix this. But when you look at it from a development standpoint, you really do want to make sure that the player is funneled to the more enjoyable parts. It doesn't mean that there can't be downtimes, right? It doesn't mean that there can't be side activities we see here. Also, that guy's a little creepy. We see those kind of side activities everywhere. That's excellent and it really does work. But at the same time, you don't want too many of them. In fact, one of the reasons why you can't enter every single building in a lot of games, number one is of course memory footprint because that's a lot that you would have to make sure was working in that game. Additionally, really entering into every single location doesn't really pay off in a game that let's say is more about driving around through an open vista and the developer has to choose what they want to do and they have to choose where they want to put their resources what i liked about bully is it's there but it's shallow right there's not a lot of places to enter but you can enter one or two for example you can go into the freak show and you can look at the different freaks in fact a couple of them say stuff about you like wanting to sleep with you together the, the two twin sisters connected siamese twins that was pretty funny there's stuff like this where you can shoot they're not incredibly in depth and they capture a really good feeling of a youth not necessarily really paying attention to everything that's going on around them but just enjoying the fun shallow activities of a kid at a carnival they do a good job with that and you notice that when you're in the city, there isn't a lot of places that you can enter. This is something that we see some games going the opposite way now where you can enter all locations, but you have to fill those locations with interesting things to do, interesting activities to keep the player engaged with the location. This is one place I was a little sad. I couldn't actually get in there. So jumping forward here, I want to do the Halloween missions and just do a little exploration of the Halloween missions and talk hey, like on? this. Of course, on, we see right away that Gary is just a jackass. I do love the fact, though, that while you can get ninja outfits for Jimmy, you can't technically get a Karate Kid outfit, but you can get the skull and bones, which were the bullies in the original Karate Kid, which this was trying to replicate. I thought that was very cool. And once again, probably a little telling of when that costume was actually created and put into the game. It makes more sense as the older style of game where Jimmy was going to be the bully all the time to wear that versus even though, again, you can get some ninja outfits, none of them really reflect the Karate Kid himself. So when it comes to Halloween, there's a number of different elements that I really liked about this. The first is one of your quests in the game is to smash some pumpkins. Now, I found this interesting because if you do not smash them all, when the next season comes up, you can find them actually in a storehouse and still smash them. 
That's such an excellent level of detail to put into the game. So many games, if they're gonna do something like this, will replace everything, you know, load the new stuff, load the new textures, the new sounds, what have you. And then the very next moment when you switch to, let's say the next season, all of that's gone. We see that is actually not replicated in Bully. There were numerous times where, whether it be graphically or even narratively in some way, there was a callback to that past season that they went through. In fact, we see it even with the trees having the leaves falling in fall prior to the winter season. I thought that was very cool. So here as Jimmy, we're running around, we're performing various little pranks on people. We're also finding out how some of these new items that we get, how some of these new weapons work. Additionally, what you will notice, especially during this time, and it can depend on how you've played the game, it can be a little loosey-goosey for this, but there's many times where you will get the request to do a prank from somebody whose group you're actually not getting along with, which I found interesting. I really did not think that was going to happen, but there's many times where you'll be running around and even if one group particularly dislikes you or you haven't done a lot for them or a lot for their people, you don't have a lot of morale with them, it will still ask you to perform quests for them. This is a little different, I would say, than the normal gameplay elements where they can ask you to do something because those fit a little bit more with their click. Here, particularly in Halloween, you get a lot of these instances where the fiction's just a little bit broken. I do love the fact that everybody's got these different uniforms. You can see all of these different costumes, and then pretty much you're the only one who ever can be able to be in them in the game prior or after this, which is a little bit odd. I would have loved for the fact for one of these guys to show up as a witch in one of the classes. But again, that's most likely to just assist in the gameplay. Yeah, here's one of the character groups I absolutely know that I'm pretty sure in this in this part they don't like me and they asked me to do that quest anyway. I really do feel they were ahead of their time when it comes to the seasons though. When you look at games, even now a lot of times a season requires a loading screen and then of course you load up your new textures and you've gone from your fall to your winter, your winter to your spring, your spring to summer. And while that does happen here, this was in 2006 and they did such a good job sort of identifying that. Additionally, you'll see some of the teachers dressed up and so forth, that's very cool. Let's talk a little, a little bit about world building. One of the things that I'm asked about a lot of times, especially when it comes to Bully, is is there a good deal of world building in it? Or is it just more like this, a prank simulator? Is it more like just going from moment to moment? There is, but there is a subtlety that occurs in Bully. And when I was doing the uh, original idea for this and I was thinking about what I wanted to cover and really then just decided, you know what, let's just play it and talk about the various different elements. One of the reasons why is because the subtlety that exists in Bully doesn't actually exist, I feel, in the later games as much. There's always going to be that mystery that Rockstar likes to put into their games, right? There's always going to be the Bigfoot, or there's always going to be something. But what happens in Bully, especially when you walk around, are the little things, like I said, where finding out that Crabble Snitch might have had a terrible life, and you sort of get that from other people in the game. Or you pick up on things just by listening. This is something that certainly does occur in the GTA games, but it doesn't occur with the subtlety that it does here. Things aren't just delivered to you as a one-liner and that's it. A lot of times it takes two or three plus some different cutscenes to really identify what the story is being told is, what's actually occurring, and I really did dig that. When it comes to the relationship systems here, you can see now I'm just pissing everybody off because I keep using my items on everyone. And speaking of that, one place where I do feel that the game really did miss a step is repetitive one-liners from characters during missions. It's insane. There's one mission where you're pretending to be boyfriend and girlfriend, you're walking hand in hand, and I'm telling you right now, one of those characters must repeat themselves 15 times. So I'm gonna run to this next quest, and I wanna talk about how game development works and how a quest can change. This quest is where you are going to basically make a dog sick by feeding them tainted meat, they're gonna poop, you're gonna put it in a bag, you're gonna put that bag in front of a door and then you're gonna set up a fire alarm so a person comes out, sees this smoking bag, cause you're gonna light it on fire and steps on it. Of course, they step in dog poop. But looking at the game files, there's been a lot of people who've been able to find that this quest most likely was different at first and that what you were doing is using rat poison. You were taking the rat poison and you were feeding it to rats and then you would take the rat and you would put that in a bag. That is one of the elements I think is really important for people to understand is that means that quest was in here for quite a while. That means that they didn't remove it. They left it in here. They left those quests in. They left the information in. They left the vocals in even for those particular elements. 
but they didn't actually get into the game. And this really isn't that unusual for any kind of game development. This kind of stuff happens all the time. They look at something, they test it, and then they ask people what they think of it. One of the most hilarious stories about this kind of thing is Peter Molyneux with Fable, the original Fable. The original Fable allowed you to kill kids. And he was having playtesters play it. And a playtester said, could you come to my desk? And Peter went to his desk and the playtester showed him a pile of babies, dead babies. And the guy was basically flexing and emoting on this pile. And Peter was all, yeah, that's getting cut from the game. So you do have those kind of situations. You have them in everything. It's one of the things that's so cool about data miners and people who go and look at information. I think overall, when you look at it, this fits more with the original prank. If anybody is over, you know, 20, 25 years old, you've probably heard of this prank before. It rarely ever works, but many people have tried it. And here in the game, it fits. It also fits probably age of the creators as well. And it fits more in line with, I would say, the juvenile and jokey setup than killing an animal, which I think for a lot of people would have been like, wow, that's pretty aggressive just for a joke. And having somebody step on a rat and squish it isn't as you know funny as just maybe making a dog slightly sick and then collecting its poop. But hey, you know what? Humor is different for everybody. But I think when you look at those two examples and you look at various other examples, you look at everything from data mining to just what developers have said during interviews, you really can get an idea of how things change. And especially in an open world game like this, how they can change so far in development that the code stays in and the voice actor has already done the voice acting. It's really interesting stuff and the more information that we can get out there about these kind of situations that can occur, the better. A lot of times, especially when somebody's play testing a game, you know, they are asked, how did this mission make you feel or did you feel like the mission really connected with the rest of the missions? And if they don't, and if multiple people say that they don't, you know, things just don't sort of flesh out, then you move on. This is something that in GTA 5, for instance, the torture scene, a lot of people were sort of questioning that being in the game. A lot of people liked it. A lot of people didn't. But I'm sure that's one of those missions where people were asked, you know, what do they think? Did it fit tonally? Because tone is so important in an open world game. Understanding that a game like this still is giving you missions on timeline. So it is certainly more condensed than uh, GTA 5, Sleeping Dogs, something like that. But it is still open. And there's something slightly different about that. And you have to make sure that all of your missions sort of hit, regardless of the fact if you do them one, two, three right after each other, even if you have some distance between them, they have to resonate with the character. Even if that character grows into, let's say, somebody more homicidal or grows, let's say, into somebody who is more jovial and certainly in, uh, enjoys life more and finds things funnier, it doesn't matter. You still need to show that progression. You can do it. You just have to make sure it doesn't cause that bump where people say, you know what, this doesn't feel entirely realistic. So the thumbs up, thumbs down system and the way that you treat others was actually even more detailed originally and they sort of decided to step away from that, make it, oh shit, make it a little bit easier, uh, make it a little less impactful. It's still there and it can help and it's used in quests and it's also used in various different elements for the story itself. But overall, it definitely is dumbed down compared to the original plan. Of course, here, once again, we get subtle reminders that the season has changed. It's not just outside, which that actually happens in a lot of games. But you see internally here, all of the decorations, a very good job. It's not a lot. They don't even require a lot. They just require enough so that you understand that the reflection that's going on outside or within the game narrative is reflected in as many places as you could possibly get it. Ah, the fly outfit. This is probably where I'll end this. This is such a cool outfit. It also shows the way people react to you because even the nerds will laugh at you in this. In fact, a lot of the rewards you get for doing some of the quests actually make you socially a little bit worse. Also, if you're on that skateboard and you don't leap off of it, you will crash on those steps, which I thought was cool. A lot of games, it would be like, oh, soft pop, and they'll use an animation pop and they'll pop you off of those. But instead, it shows it. <laughs> Fry guy. He's awesome looking. But anyway, what I was saying, when it comes to the social elements in the game, there's various different levels to it. You certainly have the color-coded enemies, which I think do a good job of allowing you to delineate where you want to go, especially at starting when the greasers are harder and you haven't really picked up a lot of your action moves from the Vietnam vet who lives in the bus, which is a whole other video we could cover. There's a lot to like in Bully. There's a lot going on. There's so much detail in the game that's subtle, though. And I think a lot of people... Possibly myself, I can't remember the first time I played this, but possibly myself missed a lot of that subtle detail, especially in the way the storytelling is done. 
especially in the way that the different characters interact with each other. For example, Crabtree, one of the things I talked about at the very starting was that originally his character was far more evil, far more conniving, far more cynical. And they still started him out that way. But as the game progresses, it's very cool because there's a moment when Jimmy gets in trouble, right? He's done something that could actually get him in trouble and they decide they're going to expel him. So they expel him and you see and hear Crabble Snitch is going to write this letter to Jimmy's mom. And later in the game, Crabble Snitch finds out that Jimmy actually didn't do anything wrong and they allow him back into the school and you can find out that he never actually sent the letter. It was very cool. It was that moment when you're like, I get it. Like he did feel a little bit for Jimmy and whether he decided that maybe Jimmy was the char the person that he wanted to be when he was a kid and he didn't get a chance to be, you're never quite sure. In fact, there's one or two teachers that I would say sort of turn the corner, something that we don't see in a lot of games all the time. Sometimes you'll see them sort of stick dogmatically to whatever attitude they have. We don't see that in Bully. Again, a little bit of subtlety there that I thought was very well done and it's rock star humor, of course, but it does fit certainly within Bully. I definitely liked it. So that's it for me. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike it, give it a thumbs down. Maybe subscribe, maybe check out Twitter or Reddit. And of course, you can become a patron to help me do more of these videos by going to the Patreon website and joining. You can jump into the Discord, which is an absolutely fantastic location. Tons of gamers all talking about games all the time in a safe environment. Something where you can ask a question and discuss games for two or three hours without any of the jackassery that we get on the normal internet. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week. Why do you have to be so mean? What a fight!